begin by uttering two curse words. Have I got your attention? Curse words in the mind of the materialistic secular world who are bent upon only the here and now. And those words are simply doctrine. And death. Death means the termination of everything they hope for. Death means it all ends and there's nothing beyond. <coughs> Doctrine means that there's a standard you've got to live by and they don't hear that. Doctrine tends to say there's a teaching for a rudimentary. That's what teaching means or doctrine means. They're synonymous. So I want to talk with you for a while, now that I have your attention, about the importance of right doctrine. The importance of right doctrine. The emphasis on the right, the importance of right doctrine. There's all sorts of teachings in the world, you're aware of that. All kinds of doctrines. But the importance of right doctrine is what we're interested in. The denominational world has said all along, doesn't make any difference what you believe, just so you're sincere in what you believe. Now they applied that to religious matters most of the time, if not all the time. They didn't realize that if you get people thinking that way, then somebody else is going to say, well, if that works, if that works with religious matters, why wouldn't it work in the area of morality? It doesn't make any difference what you believe, just so you're sincere. Now you're seeing that kind of thing being pushed upon us throughout the land. Not just in matters of religion is everything all right, just so you're sincere in the belief and doing of it, but now everything is all right in morality, which basically is immorality. But I'm interested in the right doctrine, which, of course, is being challenged, too. That there is no real right or wrong. That is an objective right or wrong, which means a thing is what it is, regardless of male or female, young or old, rich or poor, your ethnic background, whatever. It's the same for everybody. But Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, and surely most in this room, if not all old enough to know, are extremely familiar with these words of Jesus. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We also recognize that Jesus said in John 6, 14, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now the world does not want to hear that. It's almost gotten in some places where if you say that you're politically incorrect and no, we can't have that, that's a hate crime because what about the people who don't believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life? Well, you see how things begin to work and how Satan works and incrementally he was, he's willing to take 10 steps forward and nine steps back to advance the one step and do it very slowly. But I'm interested, and God's interested, because the Bible tells me so, and once the Bible's proven to be the infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, final, and complete revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, then it becomes a proof text for learning right and wrong. So when the Bible tells me so, God is speaking to me. God is telling me how to believe and what to do and how to act. False teachers, especially religious liberals, and let me again define liberal. I mean anybody loosing men from what God has bound on them is obligatory in his word. Anybody teaching a doctrine that allows us to be loosed from the obligations God in his word places upon us is a liberal. Now, there's good ways we can use that word liberal. A lot of my brethren don't like it, but that's liberal in giving of your financial means. That's wholesome. That'll get you to heaven. But nevertheless, there is the way that is wrong, and that's why I use the word liberal here and define it for you. 
But these false teachers are constantly opposing and militantly attacking the idea that doctrine is important. Ever since I have started preaching at 18, I've been hearing this. Before I was old enough to preach, back in the late 50s and uh, early 60s, very early 60s, it was the man and not the plan. You may remember back some time ago in a lectureship that Brother Doug McClish preached on that subject in which they're saying you, you got to emphasize Jesus. You don't emphasize doctrine. You just emphasize Jesus. I frankly don't know how anybody can do that because it's the doctrine of the Bible that teaches you about Jesus and teaches you what Jesus taught. So a lot of these things won't make sense. We're not even trying to say they make good sense. We're saying that is what people teach. And remember, the devil must get you away from God's Word and the doing of it to cause you to lose your soul, and he has all sorts of avenues to do that. They will teach then that Jesus is important, but not doctrine, not teaching. So these same people, many of them in the church, seek to promote oneness or unity by urging Bible teachers to merely preach Jesus as they would define it and forget about doctrinal issues, forget about how you are to live in the church to be faithful to God, to not get into the specific details, to not deal with individuals and their conduct. Of course, I have a hard time when I see the first sin in the church in Jerusalem in Acts 5, and he gets very specific down to one husband and wife and the specific sin of lying over money that they, that they dealt with. So it's obvious God's interested in how each one of us lives and how we think and what we do and that he has a certain standard for us to live by and he doesn't appreciate it at all when we violate it. He didn't with Ananias and Sapphira. But these people say that doctrinal issues are just not important. We can't have the unity for which Jesus prayed in John 17, Paul commanded in 1 Corinthians 1.10, and uh, the platform for which is set out by Paul by inspiration in Ephesians chapter 4. So this is an important study the importance of right doctrine. Now, if Bible doctrine is not important, what is the very meaning of this passage? Whosoever, now that's as broad as the human race, transgresseth, the American standard said, goeth onward, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. Whatever abiding in the doctrine of Christ is, folks, I want to abide in it because that's the only way I can have God. If I don't abide in it, surely we recognize whatever it means at this point. I don't have God. Now notice, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son, 2 John 9 through 10. I'd like to think everyone in here that's accountable to God is saying, I want to abide in the doctrine of Christ because I want to be well-pleasing to the Father and the Son. Again, 2 John 9 through 10. But now to try to step aside from that and to set it aside, to say it doesn't mean what it says, it's argued by those I have defined as liberals that doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, simply means the doctrine about Christ. You read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and you read about the life of Christ, and that's all that it means. However, Jesus, in his teaching on earth to his disciples concerning the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees, had this to say in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 12. Of the disciples, it is said, then understand they then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, was he saying beware of the information about the history of how the Pharisees and Sadducees came into existence and the details about how they lived? Or was he talking about what the Pharisees and Sadducees taught that was wrong, that if you believe it, it influences you, because that is leaven, it influences you for evil. 
Well, of course, I don't know of a liberal that would say, well, all he's saying here in Matthew 16, 12 is that you're just studying about the history of the development uh, and the beliefs just for information's sake of the Pharisees and Sadducees. It's obvious he's saying there's right doctrine, there's false doctrine. It's obvious that 2 John 9, 10 is talking about what particularly the New Testament teaches about what's right and wrong. And Jesus is saying if you follow what makes Pharisees Pharisees and if you follow the teaching that makes Sadducees Sadducees, you're going to be influenced for evil by them. So this idea that the doctrine of Christ means the doctrine about Christ just doesn't hold water. It's another effort by those who don't serve Christ faithfully to get us away from what the Bible teaches. It is further suggested that there are no commandments and no law, just love. Well, we wouldn't know a thing about the love of Christ. It wasn't for the details taught in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. But what do you do when you say just love? When John 14, 15, Jesus said to the apostles, if you love me, keep my commandments. American Standard says you will keep my commandments. But I, how do I learn about commandments? Commandments are orders from Christ telling me how to think, say, and live. It sort of sounds like it goes against the idea of, well, just have a romantic, philosophically romantic, subjective, syrupy, sentimental feeling about somebody, and that makes everything all right. Although that seems to be the false definition of love. If people just understood the love that is in John 3.16 that God had for the world that caused him to give his son, the love of Christ for the world to undergo what all he did to save us from our sins, the love that Paul discusses in detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, they would know that it's far beyond some sort of feeling, that it is a love that can be commanded, agapao, we know it better is agape but it's a love that can be commanded it's a love that is of the intellect and rational it doesn't rule out the loves that are emotional and your family love and your love for your brethren and so forth but it keeps all of those emotional loves in check it keeps them always operating according to the absolute objective standard that is the perfect law of liberty and thus, you can command things like suffering for Christ. No, that's no good feeling. If you're being beat up because you're a Christian, that's no good feeling at all. You don't look forward to that. It would be like somebody saying, I've got a root canal scheduled for Tuesday, and they have run out of anesthetic, and I'm just looking forward to that so much. That would be ridiculous. Absurd to the nth degree. So the love of which we are to have toward God and toward the Word of God. You know, if you love God, you will love the things of God, and the Word of God is one of them. Then it's a love that leads us to comply with God's will no matter the suffering we must undergo. Also, you have uh, the law of liberty, the perfect, complete law of liberty of James 1.25. How can you read that and say, well, it's just all love and no law? And then Paul writes to the church in Rome in Romans 8 and verse 2 and says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So the perfect law of liberty is the gospel system, the faith for which we are to contend that's been revealed by the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. And thus the truth of God that we started with in John 8, 31 and 32 is set out in words. If you continue in my words, then are you my disciples, and ye shall know the truth. Jesus said in his prayer in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But word is doctrine. Word conveys message. Word says here's the way to live. Here's the way not to live. Here's what's godly. Here's what's not. 
How would you know what sin is since it's the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. If it's all love and no law, there would be no sin in the world. You have to have a law to transgress before sin can be. Paul wrote, the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And we might ask Paul, are they? Well, the Holy Spirit guided him as an apostle of Christ, an ambassador of the court of heaven to earth, 1 Corinthians 14, 37b. And he said, these things I'm writing are the commandments of the Lord. Well, don't we have to study what is said to understand the commandments applicable to you and me? Certainly we do. So this idea that just simply says that uh, love exists and it's not really what you believe or teaching. You just got to have this good feeling toward everybody. It's ridiculous. It's absurd on the very face of the fact we have a Bible and what's in the Bible. And specifically the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Paul also wrote... wrote Fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2. How do you do that? If there's not something in the words that conveys God's message to me, saying, David Brown, here's the way you live. Here's the way you speak. Here's the way you act. Here's the way you live as a man. And when you marry as a husband and as a, a father and so forth with woman, wife, and mother, and on down through life. It means there is then teaching that we must learn that's more than just about Christ, but how he says we ought to think, speak, and live. Thus, we cannot take the position that doctrine is not important. It is of the utmost importance, and thus the study of the importance of right doctrine. The word doctrine means, as I've said already, instruction teaching. When we speak of the New Testament as a divine pattern or an inspired blueprint, all we're meaning is, is that it conveys the message of God to us concerning how we're to think, speak, and live. When you preach Christ and Him crucified, you're preaching the gospel of Christ, the glad tidings of Christ, the way of life, the truth of life, the way we're to do. How would you ever know to repent if you didn't have instruction from God to repent? Well, repent of what? I don't know. Well, turn to what? I don't know. I just know Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John tells me there's God and He loved me and gave me Christ and I love Him. Do I need to know anything more than that? No, just love one another. Well, how do I love one another? Just have a good feeling about everybody. That's not Bible teaching. That's not the gospel of Christ. So when we see the word of doctrine means instruction and teaching, therefore the doctrine of Christ is the instruction or teaching that Christ gave. And his personal teaching continues through the teaching of the apostles. And they were inspired of the Holy Spirit in their writings. Luke 24, 49, 2 Timothy has already quoted this, 3, 16. In 2 Peter 1.21. Okay. How important is the doctrine or teaching of Christ? Well remember Timothy is a preacher of the gospel. He is to live like the gospel says. And he is to teach only the gospel of Christ. So Paul told Timothy to give attendance to doctrine. And charge some that they teach no other doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, 13, 16, chapter 1, verse 3. Teach no other doctrine. In other words, there is a certain body of truth, and we're not to deviate from it. We're to teach it. We're to confirm it. We're to contend for it. We're to live it out in our lives. And we're not to tolerate people deviating from it. Titus was told to speak the things which become sound doctrine. Wholesome teaching, Titus 2 and verse 1. Well, if there's not a body of doctrine that's objective to which I can go to and study and understand and live it myself and teach others and even defend it, what sense does this make? 
But we go further. Paul warns some that some will not endure sound doctrine. 2 Timothy 4, 3. What does that mean? Not endure wholesome teaching. They won't stand the truth that's in it that says, hey, you're wrong, you must change. And of course, we live in an age that says, I can't say you're wrong. Do that, you're a wicked person. And so it turns the tables. The person that tries to show the way of life because he exposes sin in the person's life, then that person becomes the bad guy and the person that's in sin is a good guy. Because we have learned to accept emotions over facts. And we don't like facts. Facts are just facts. You're sitting right now in a pew. I can define pew and you know exactly what that means. I don't want to be sitting in a pew. Well, you can get up and walk out of it, but right now you're sitting in it. That is an absolute fact. We could talk about the kind of pew it is. We could talk about the padding in the pew, which I'm glad now we can talk about. <laughs> but the point is, it's a fact you're sitting in a pew. Now, how are you going to get around that? You want me to smile at you and say, oh, you just think you're sitting in a pew. Don't worry about it. You're not. Just smile there and feel good. That's ridiculous. It's absurd. It goes against nature. It's contrary to the way you operate. But people like that because they don't want to be sitting in a pew. They're not sitting in a pew. But what are they doing? They're sitting in a pew. But they don't want to sit in a pew. But they're sitting in a pew. No, they don't think they are, so they're not. So what am I supposed to do? Say, isn't it nice to be standing up? That's the way it works. And don't tell me I'm in a pew. Well, what are you in? It's not a pew, but you're sitting in a pew. No, that's just your viewpoint. That, believe it or not, walks through all sorts of philosophy courses and all kinds of high places that move and shape things today. So he warned that some will not endure sound doctrine, that we are as children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4.14. Do you know that statement in Ephesians 4 is parallel to the discussion of Paul about the design and purpose and uh, end of miraculous gifts in the early church, telling us the reason they were there in the first place. They didn't have a completed Bible. Ephesians 4 is in that same, same context. And what he's saying here, without a completed, perfect law of liberty, New Testament, you're like children, Paul's to and fro and cared about every wind of doctrine. Paul was saying, I'm looking forward to the day when we've got a completed, written-down Bible. We won't have that problem. Well, we do have that problem. It's not the fault of the completed, written-down Bible. It's because people won't study it. And they come up with ideas and views like we're studying right now, that doctrine is not important. God expects the faithful to mark them which caused divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine, Romans 16, 70. What does that mean? Somebody's not looking sort of sickly, smiling at one another, and their view of just love and no commandment to keep. And thus, if you quit smiling and hugging, then you have transgressed the law of Christ. That is absolutely ridiculous. No wonder people in the church in various places are trying to justify all sorts of immoral activity among the brethren. Trying to justify all sorts of departures in religion when it comes to worship and other things, and the organization of the church and so forth. They don't have any appreciation of doctrine. They don't have any appreciation of the authority of God set out in the Word of God. They don't have any appreciation of much of any kind of authority, but I'm going to have it my way. That's their authority. Elders are commanded to be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers, Titus 1.9. Uh, one thing that's happened to elders a lot of places is they don't believe this. Yeah, but it's in the Bible. But there's some of those that believe that all you have to do is smile big and squeeze heavy and you've got the church right where it ought to be and the devil's run out. That's far from the truth. It's by sound teaching it's by knowing the book. It's by seeing that members live like the book says. And they're to exhort and convict the gainsayers. That is, those that speak against the truth. Titus 1.9. That's their duty. They're not faithful to God if they don't do it. There are other things they must do to be faithful, but that's one of them. Every Christian 
is to hold fast the form of sound words, doctrine. How do you do that? There's not something to believe and to obey. Notice, every one of us, this wasn't said to people we think of as full-time preachers, only earnestly contend with the faith or the doctrine of Christ, 2 Timothy 1, 13, Jude 3. That's, that's said to every one of us according to our several abilities or wherever you are. Some of the greatest places you have to contend with the faith is in school as a student and on the job and with your neighbors. Why do we think it's in a formal debate such as I've had and many have had far more than I have, although that's part of it, does rule it out. One reason years ago, several reasons, but one of them many years ago that caused a lot of public oral debates between faithful gospel preachers and denominational world and others is because the members were mixing up with their neighbors every day in study. Yes, there was a greater interest in religious matters. That's true. Several other things that caused those kind of things. People had courage of their convictions. They actually thought what they believed was right and was worth standing for and fighting for. And they would. Nowadays, anything goes. But the point is, it's the members who are influencing the world wherever they are. We can get very concerned over all sorts of secular things that make no difference whatsoever and let the scripture slide. But we shouldn't and we oughtn't because it's contrary to living the Christian life. So in the light of all this, we must say, therefore, we see not only the importance of doctrine, but also the strict warning to anyone who would pervert or change the doctrine of Christ in any way whatsoever. I, I dealt this past week. In fact, uh, this afternoon I hope to, to set forth, I want to do something to keep you awake this afternoon, some of the stuff that I pointed out over some members of the church or in the chat room contending that while they didn't believe in theistic evolution, I'll define it this afternoon, they didn't really think it was a matter to be all that concerned about it, that if somebody did believe it, it, would, it wouldn't keep them out of heaven. Now, they think they're sound in the faith. And that's the furthest thing from being sound in the faith, when they really understand what they're affirming, and some really don't. So I hope to deal with that this afternoon, Lord willing. If doctrine is unimportant, then we can ignore the doctrine of the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the acts of worship, the plan of salvation, you carry that on the organization of the church. Uh, you could uh, carry it into the matter of the work of the church, the multiplicity of things that are to be done to carry out the work God's ordained the church to do. You could go on and on. Of course, liberals, as I've defined it, are diligently contending that these doctrines and others are not important, that such issues are not worthy of debate. They come at it in different ways. Back about nearly 40 years ago, there was what was called the Big F, Little F Fellowship, uppercase, lowercase fellowship, in which if you believe certain things, like God exists, Christ is the Son of God and Savior of the world, Man is lost in sin. Christ is the only Savior. That's all you really needed to believe. And everybody could unite on that. And thus all other things that has caused problems over the years could just be overlooked. Of course, that won't even work because there'll be differences over God and there'll be differences over Christ and so forth. But that's the way people try to work it so they won't have to deal with particulars and specifics. They'd a lot rather deal in generalities. Brett, listen, mankind in general, there's a word I want to use, general, likes to deal in generalities. The problem is getting down to specifics. When you set up a three-line syllogism, what's called Aristotelian uh, logic, the major premise is saying sin is bad or sin separates you from God, or living in sin sends you to hell. Now who is going to say that believes in God, Christ, and the Bible that that's wrong? But when I come down here to the minor premise, that's where I make the application of the major premise. And I say, let's just use somebody's name that won't fall out the floor. 
I use Jed. He wouldn't fall out of the floor. Jed is a sinner. Specifically, here's his sin. Therefore, Jed is going to lose his soul. Now, it gets rather particular when we get to the minor premise, doesn't it? Reminds me of the, um, of the little boy who went to church. His daddy didn't go that day. So when he got home, his daddy said, How things go today? He said, Fine. He said, What did the preacher preach on? He said, he Preached on sin. He said, Was he for it or against it? The boy said, He was against it. <laughs> who wouldn't who names the name of Christ as Savior say, I'm not against sin. But when it comes down to your specific beliefs and acts that transgress God's law and transgress the law of sin, 1 John 3, 4, that's where it gets touchy. Thus, what's touchy as far as members of the church? Speaking specifically on your giving and your contributing of your time and your money. Whoops. Ooh. Just preach on sin and be against it. We like that. You, you get down to particulars. And it comes right down. You can do it every aspect of life since God's rule over our whole life. Whether you, as a man, there's a certain way a man ought to live. There's a certain way a man when he marries ought to live. There's a certain way a man when he's a parent, father ought to live. Do that with a wife and a woman and so on. What about when it comes to organizing the church? Are there certain things elders ought to do? Preachers ought to do. Deacons ought to do. Bible class teachings ought to do. They have certain obligations peculiar to them. What about the Bible teaching on who's my neighbor? That seems to be pretty particular, doesn't it? Who is my neighbor? And so on we go. So just, you know, when I take this position, just love everybody. And by love, I mean just have a sweet, sickening, dripping in honey, squeeze you attitude then you just overlook everything else. Don't point a finger at me and say, here specifically is the sin of which you're guilty. Don't do that. Well, when you can find that disposition condemned in the Bible, I'll be glad to follow it. If you want to know one reason, one reason, I emphasize that, one reason that the Lord's church, because there are several reasons that, to be added to this, but one reason that the Lord's church is not growing like it ought to is that we aren't occupying minor premise sermons. You remember the Uncle Sam? Uncle Sam wants you. Well, of course, if you look at it, it's always you. He's pointing right at you. I guess we ought to get mad at Uncle Sam because Uncle Sam wants you and you and you and you and you and you and you. And you. Shouldn't do that. No, no, that means I'm personally responsible for things I think, say, and do. But you don't tell me I'm wrong. And so we've fallen down over the years. We don't have gospel meetings we used to. And yet today it cries out more than ever that we speak specifically into the point about sins. You compare the society and culture of 1900 to the society and culture today. And you see now that we mean more than ever to boldly point out these particular things. We won't do it. We just want the preacher to be against sin. That's all it is. We all are against sin. So, regardless of this particular thing, when liberals are diligently contending that these doctrines and others are not important, that such issues are not worthy of debate, we nevertheless should submit to Christ's doctrine in particulars. For therein only do we purify our souls from sin. The Apostle Peter wrote by inspiration of the Spirit. He wrote part of the New Testament of Christ. It will be there to judge us on the last great day. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit. Unto unfeigned love. That means unpretended love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again. Now watch how that love connects real quickly to the Word of God. Being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1, 22. Right doctrine is important. And we need to spend time in studying it. 
We need not only know that sin, the transgression of God's law, in general is wrong, but we need to know particulars. And so as we bring the lesson to a close, you have to ask yourself the question this morning, am, am I a Christian or am I still lost in my sins and separated from God? Well, now you've got to get specific on that. If I am in that condition, if you judge yourself in that commit, uh, condition, you have to ask yourself, well, what specifically does God require of me? And if you don't go to the teaching of the New Testament, sound doctrine, wholesome words, how are you going to find out? So there are steps in the plan of salvation. It was done and preached that way by brethren restoring the ancient order of things to make it simple and clear so the person in sin would know what to do. And thus we've always pointed out that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And that you must believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be buried with your Lord in baptism. That's getting particular. Well, somebody says, I believed, I repented. Well, that's insufficient. Necessary, but insufficient. You must confess your faith in Christ and be baptized for the remission of sins. The Lord will add you to the church, and there you serve him faithfully. Well, well what's involved in serving him faithfully? Most of the New Testament's written to tell you about that. Most of the New Testament is written to tell you about that. Even while the New Testament was being given, brethren were sinning, and the Lord saw fit in his wisdom to give us that New Testament by correcting a great many things in the early church before the New Testament was even fully revealed and set down. We don't think about that. So when we talk about preaching the whole counsel of God or all the counsel of God, it's far more than saying, sin and I'm again it. it gets down to particulars and when you're studying your Bible at home if you're not thinking specifically in your own mind about it its application to you and what it says about how you're thinking speaking and living and who you're associating with how you are to your family etc what good is your Bible study and that raises this question are we studying our Bibles every day all sorts of ways to study it but do you just read it every day you know, just reading it every day systematically will familiarize yourself with the contents before you ever get into word studies or other kinds of studies. You have to be familiar with the content. And I know of no other way to do it than to read regularly and systematically from the book divine. Well, if you're a child of God and have sinned, you need to repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. They made it simple and plain in the preaching of those things essential to salvation. Can we do less? Therefore, if you're subject to the call of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.